Today, I want to cover four myths that come up frequently in workers' comp. The first one being you have to be on the job doing what you're supposed to be doing when you're injured, which nah, that's not necessarily true. Oftentimes, you can notice that an injury came up after the fact. One of the most common types of injuries we see in workers' comp is actually cancer, which necessarily doesn't happen overnight or on the job. Things like asbestos can cause cancer up to 20 years later. In my firm, we represent a lot of firefighters and first responders who are also around chemicals and other known carcinogens, and they develop cancer sometimes 5 to 15 years after they've actually retired from their employment. So there are a number of injuries which don't necessarily manifest themselves right away or that are noticeable right there on the job. And quite frankly, their job duties or exposure on the job could cause or contribute to what they're going through, and they may not necessarily realize it until later on. So if you do have some form of disease in particular and you're curious about whether or not it's work-related, it might actually be. Even if it's been a while, you may not know. So, And it doesn't mean at the same time that you can't recover for that injury if it's years later, depending upon when you had knowledge that the injury might be work-related. So if you got something going on, I highly recommend you check it out. The second most common myth is that you actually have to be on your job site when you're injured. And now... There's a lot of rules and regulations that determine whether or not workers' comp applies if you're off of site, but there are a fair number of situations where you can actually collect workers' comp benefits despite not being on your employer's site. For example, if you're running an uh, errand for your employer off of site and you get in a car accident, that could be a valid workers' comp case. If you're on a paid break and you happen to run across the street to your car to get something or you want to go smoke a cigarette or do something else, that could technically be workers' comp as well. And if you're actually traveling between job sites, for example, that could also be workers' comp. So there's a number of scenarios where you're not necessarily on the employer's premises, but you get hurt, and it's still technically covered by workers' compensation. The third most common myth, and probably the most egregious, is that your employer and the insurance company are there to look out for you. And I'm sure we've all seen the Geico or Allstate commercials where the person's house is burning down and the insurance agents, they're hugging the person at three in the morning and stroking their back and telling them it's going to be all okay and they're there for them. And that's, it can't be farther from the truth, right? At the end of the day, the insurance company is not there for you. They're there for their investors, for the shareholders. The idea is to take in more money and premiums and you pay out in games to ensure that there's profit for the company. And so your employer's not really going to be there for you. The insurance company's certainly not going to be there for you. You need to be your own advocate and prepare for the worst. The fourth miss is that if you have an attorney, what you pay them is going to eat into your workers' comp benefits. And that's not necessarily true. So if you're receiving temporary disability, for example, the lawyer is not entitled to that. The lawyer may be entitled to a portion of temporary disability if, for example, your case was denied and they had to fight to go get you retro temporary disability that you wouldn't have been otherwise entitled to had they not stepped up and fought for you. Additionally, workers' comp typically pays lawyers' fees out of settlements, which means if you have a settlement including permanent disability and future medical care, the lawyer's fee would ultimately be paid from that. 